Welcome once again to Wednesday at the Well. You know, the three young people who gave us our welcome, who are part of our youth and children's ministry here. Uh, they are the grandchildren of none other than Deacon Lazane, and we are very grateful uh, that they opened us up tonight. But I thank you that you are with us as we have been exploring the truth about the church. This is a march through the book of Acts that gives the history of the church. And I have to say, I have enjoyed examining the book of Acts in the way we have been looking at this word. It has been relevatory. It has also helped me personally as we have looked at these issues in the midst of a pandemic, coming out of a pandemic and re-examining what the role of the church is. So thank you for being with us tonight. I wanna to say thank you to the 1700 people who have signed up to be a part of this Bible study. You've been receiving the PDFs that we publish every Friday. And I've been saying that I'm going to have these podcasts, these audio uh, lessons for you that you'll be able to listen in your car while you're working out. They are coming soon. Um, I must apologize that you've not received them as of yet as I have been busy with a variety of other things and I have yet to be able to finish the recordings so that you can have these on your phone. So we want you to have Bible study on your phone, uh, Bible study uh, in your house, Bible study on your computer or your iPad. Wherever you are, we want you to be able to receive the Word of God. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now and let's prepare and go into this word tonight, which I believe will be a real blessing to you. Let's go to God. Lord, we come to you this evening. We are grateful that you continue to hold us and we are thankful for your son, Jesus. May you allow us to explore your word this day, that we may receive revelation, that we may practice what is put forth in your word. We thank you for those who have gone before us, who are now ancestors and are part of the cloud of witnesses, who give us direction and teaching. But we are most grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, who is our rabbi, our Messiah, our savior, who is the liberation leader to free our spirits that we may reach the capacity that you call us uh, to reach for. We offer this prayer this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us for this Wednesday at the Well, The Truth About the Church, where we are looking at the book of Acts. We're going to begin by reading from Acts, the seventh chapter, beginning with verse 54. It'll be coming up on your screen. Acts 7, beginning with verse 54 through about verse 60. We're going to look at the message translation. I'm going to make a few uh, translations myself. We like to call it the OM3, the Otis Moss III uh, translation. But this is very important as we are going to be examining courage or courageous commitment. I preached on it on Sunday, but we want to uh, get involved in this word once again today. Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 54. At that point, they went wild, a rioting mob of catcalls and whistles all over the place. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, hardly noticed he only had eyes for God, whom he saw in all his glory with Jesus standing at his side. He said, oh, I see heaven wide open and the Son of Man standing at God's side, yelling and hissing the mob drowned him out. Now in full stampede, they dragged him out of town and pelted him with rocks. The ringleaders took off their coats and asked a young man named Saul to watch them. As the rocks rained down, Stephen prayed, Master Jesus, take my life. Then he knelt down praying, Lord, enough. 
for everyone to hear. Master, don't blame them for this sin. This was his last words. Then he died. Saul was right there congratulating the killers. He said, Master, don't blame them for this sin. His last words. Then he died. Saul was right there congratulating the killers. We'd invite you to, to mark uh, this word if you're using a pen and paper uh, to write down Acts 7, verses 54 uh, through 60. You'll also have the PDF, which we publish uh, toward the end of the week. Also, if you are using an, an app, please mark uh, in your notes section of your app, uh, Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 54. Let us first begin by going back a little bit in history to get an understanding of Stephen. Stephen has recently been chosen as a deacon. Let's look at that word deacon. Deacon means servant. He has been chosen as deacon uh, with six other men who will be feeding serving, caring for widows. So a vocabulary word, deacon, uh, meaning servant. And the other vocabulary word is widow, meaning that your spouse has died. This is very important, and I, I want you to know a little bit of history in this ancient time period. If you were a woman and you were married, you did not have uh, the rights like you do today. Uh, women, in many ways, were, were treated as second-class citizens. And if your husband died, it could leave you destitute. Now, let's look at what this new movement, this Jesus movement, they call the followers of the way, the people who are following Christ and have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. They believe that women should not be destitute, uh, that women are included in this new movement where they have status and rights. Let me help you out for those who have a very patriarchal perspective. The churches, the early churches, were run by women. Women ran the households and many of the churches uh, that were operating were in houses, small spaces. So it was the women who were the people who laid out the liturgy, put things together for the entire worship service. You would call them, I guess an, an analogous word today, would be the elders of the church, or uh, they might be considered to be the administrators of the church. Uh, essentially what uh, a bishop is over a district, you might have a, a sister, uh, a woman who was superintendent uh, for a small location, maybe their house or maybe a couple other locations. And so it was this community that did not believe uh, that women who lost their husbands should be destitute, number one. Number two is that women, when they uh, were widows, oftentimes would be exploited uh, by people who were looking to make money off of vulnerable people. Let me explain how that would happen. You would have someone who lost their husband. And after that, they would maybe need money or need a loan. Well, guess what? There's always a loan shark running around saying, I can take care of you with an exorbitant amount of interest, or they may violate that woman. So here you have the church community stepping in, seeing that there is a need to ensure uh, that women who were widows who would not be destitute and they would not be exploited by predatory men. Now, I bet some of you didn't even know that about uh, Christian history because we have such a modern framework of how we, we view the ancient church. So Stephen was a part of this group and his primary role uh, was to care for those people who were vulnerable. And he was full of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we looked in our lesson, Holy Spirit is that breath of God, being filled by the breath of God. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was a wise 
person, meaning he knows what to do with the knowledge he has. There are a lot of people who have knowledge, but they may not have wisdom. What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is the accumulation of information. Wisdom, the application, knowing what to do with the information you have. So Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. See that again? Holy Spirit, see that word? Holy Spirit equals breath, the breath of God. And he is filled with wisdom. See that word wisdom? Wisdom equals the application of knowledge, knowing what to do with the knowledge, application of the knowledge, ethical application of the knowledge. So here you have a person who is filled with the Spirit, he's wise, and he operates in an ethical manner. So in the beginning of chapter 7, we didn't read the entire chapter, uh, but I want to give you a framework so that we get down to this uh, last portion that we want to lift up. Stephen is brought before Sanhedrin, an ancient religious council, primarily Jews, and Stephen is a Jew, and the early church is a Jewish movement. It is Jewish people who are together who are practicing all of the rituals in the Jewish tradition. So there is not this big difference between when you say Christian and Jew. If you said someone was a Christ follower, you were talking about a Jewish person who was following a rabbi, Messiah, who they are now saying is Savior by the name of Jesus Christ. They were Jews. So you now have Jews communicating with each other, differences of opinion, but they're brought before Sanhedrin raising the question about uh, their theology. What is this that you believe? Uh, how are you practicing uh, the Jewish faith? And this is when Stephen begins to speak. We see that he knows the tradition incredibly well. So read chapter 7 and you will see that he walks through the history of the tradition. Let me stop there. This is very important for our lesson today. Most of us have no idea about our tradition. As a matter of fact, there are many people who are part of Trinity United Church of Christ and don't even know what the United Church of Christ is. We don't know a difference between Baptists and the United Church of Christ and Presbyterian and Lutheran or Church of God in Christ. All of these traditions, here's your big vocabulary word for today, are Protestant traditions. That word Protestant simply meaning protest. It comes from a European movement, specifically a person by the name of Martin Luther. See that name? Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a person who was part of the Roman Catholic Church, and he had some questions about the practice. Should I be able to read scripture? Should I be able to go to God myself? He, he was raising questions about the practice, and it became a revolution. It became a protest when he laid out his theses, uh, his perspective on how we should engage in questioning uh, the practices of the Roman Catholic Church. Out of that, just real short history, out of that we get all of the Protestant denominations, protest denominations, and in those protest denominations, just about all of them are very big on autonomy or an individual having access to God. What does that mean? In Orthodox traditions, Roman Catholic, Ethiopian Orthodox, so on, the Armenian, the Greek, you would go to church and you would ask your, your priest, you, you would have access to God, but you would ask your priest pray for me. The priest would take your information and the priest would go into the sanctuary and it was his job to pray for you. There was an, what is known as an intermediary. That was the priest. 
or you would confess, and you would confess to an intermediary, uh, that person being the priest, the priest would then take uh, that confession, would go before God. There was an elaborate system. So Martin Luther was questioning that system. We end up with uh, the Protestant uh, tradition. And Trinity is part of the congregational tradition, the United Church of Christ, uh, that was formed in 1957. I, I give you that information because a lot of us don't know the tradition. Now, for people of African descent, though we may have the name, maybe Presbyterian, United Church of Christ, or Baptist, we bring something unique to the table in our tradition. So in the black tradition, I'm using that in a very broad sense, we have a different theology. Well, what is that theology? Number one in our theology is there is no separation between sacred and secular. Let me say it again so you see that. No separation between sacred and secular within the black tradition. What does that mean? It means that your relationship with God is not segmented solely on Sunday or when you're in the church house. Because as black people, people of African descent, we believe that everywhere you go is a sacred act. Let me give you an example. Maybe some of you have an elder in your family. They might be washing clothes or ironing. And all of a sudden they're singing a hymn in the process and they will tell you that they are, they're worshiping as they're doing this work. Or you may be at a church barbecue <laughs> and it becomes important to recognize that uh, obviously you pray before you eat, but that act is not separate from your relationship with God. So there is no separation between sacred and secular. Now, the songs, the music you listen to, the dances you partake in, uh, the people you like and engage with, all of those are connected spiritually to your relationship overall with God. Now, that's something that we brought with us from Africa and it was very important in our theology. Whereas we witness other people who said, oh, Sunday I worship, I love the Lord, but then on Monday I keep you as a slave because there's a difference between sacred and secular. Black people brought those two things together. The second thing is that in, within the black tradition, everyone, no matter who you are, has the stamp of the divine upon them. Uh, as it says in Acts, that God is no respecter of persons. There's neither Jew, nor Greek, nor male, nor female, uh, that we are all one in Christ. What we also brought was the idea is that every human being, no matter your tradition, no matter what you live, no matter what you believe, you are a child of God. You have the stamp of the divine upon you, and it is incumbent upon me to treat you, even if you don't realize it, that you are sacred. That's something that black people brought to the United States and was a part of the way and the manner in which we worship. The third thing that became very important that is a part of our tradition is the recognition of ancestors, which is in accordance with the Bible. Why do I mention that? Well, when you're reading the Bible, it will say so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so, telling you all the people who lived before this individual, just as when you're reading about the genealogy of Jesus. Well, that is lifting up ancestors and history. And within our tradition, if you go to any black church, the history of that church becomes important. Don't you know, so-and-so used to sit here and such-and-such such gave money in order for, for this piece of stained glass. And people will mention people who've passed on as if they are still present with us right now. We do it here at Trinity. Many of you have heard myself, 
Dr. Wright, other people mention someone by the name of Jeffrey Radford. You, you've heard uh, people uh, mention Reverend Barbara Allen. They are ancestors. We respect what they have done. And we believe, as scripture says, but it comes also from Africa, that they are part of what is known as the great cloud of witnesses, that they rest with God and the wisdom that they have passed on, we stand on their shoulders. And the fourth thing that a final thing, there's a lot of things, but the fourth thing I'm just gonna give you is also elder esteem and elder respect. Within the, the black tradition, veneration of elders is incredibly important. That when you reach a certain age, and eldership is not just age, it is also wisdom. You will go, it doesn't make a difference what church you are part of, you will notice that there is an elder esteem in just about every tradition where there are a number of black people, especially if they have roots in the South. We do it here. We have Elder Sunday. We venerate our elders because in the African tradition, it is believed that elders, one, are closer to God because they're moving closer to the River Jordan. Two, elders contain a library within their spirits. The African uh, uh, proverb is when an elder passes, the village loses a library. So we recognize all of those things. That's part of our tradition. So when you speak about black people and our faith, do not make the mistake of saying that we are just like everyone else, but we're just of a different color. No, we have a different theology. We have a different framework of how we understand and relate to Jesus and relate to the body and to the body of Christ and to uh, the word of God. We are also Christ centric within the black tradition. Now, these are very generalized, but Christ centric means that we're Jesus folk. You can go to just about any black church and mention Jesus. Now, there are other places you mention Jesus and they're like, well, you know, he's a nice teacher, but uh, there's some doctrinal problems that I had. No, 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 no. Black folk, we understand, uh, as Cornell West would say, uh, the organic theology that bursts forth through our connectivity to Jesus. That's why I can go to any church and I can talk about Jesus and they will connect and there are certain phrases of call and response that no matter what tradition you're in, people recognize. They hung him high, they stretched him wide, and then he died. But three days later, he rose again. Jesus, what? Pick me up. What? Turned me around, planted my feet on solid ground. So there's veneration of Jesus. We are Christ-centric. And it is Stephen who knows the tradition. Here is your assignment. You must learn your tradition. Maybe you grew up in Trinity, so uh, you don't have this assignment. But maybe you grew up in a black Catholic church like a St. Sabina, or you came out of the Baptist tradition, or maybe it was a Presbyterian or Lutheran, or maybe no tradition at all. You just went occasionally to church. You should write in your journal, in your notes, just write in your journal, in your notes, some of the experiences, where, where did you witness that sacred and secular, uh, there was no um, partition, there was no wall between the two? I, I use the example, I've told the story many times that I went to see Luther Vandross uh, in concert. I, I, I was with a group that brought us there. And it was also the, uh, the whole DeBarge family opened up. And I remember there was a woman on the third row. She was shouting like it was in ch we were in church. And I realized it was a woman that was from my church, my father's church. Because even though we were in, quote, a secular space, Luther was singing a so-called secular song. We didn't see the separation. Uh, the elation, the connectivity, and the spirit working, because here was Luther talking about love. And love is something that comes from 
God. And when he was used going on those runs, those no, 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 no's that, that that Luther does, she just went in, as a whole lot of other people did uh, in the space that we were we were witnessing. Uh, so it, your assignment is to find those spaces, those four things that I just mentioned, uh, where where we, uh, where you, and where we, when I say we, talking about our community, where those uh, aspects of our tradition are brought forth. So Stephen knew the tradition. Stephen knew the tradition. Now the second thing that Stephen did that's very important to see in, in this scripture is Stephen is speaking to believers. Now in America you will hear the word evangelical, evangelism, uh, speaking to people who don't know Jesus, but you will notice that there is a lot of time spent in the Bible from the prophets, and here we see with Jesus, right? I'm sorry, with Stephen here, and in Jesus in the Gospels, he spends a lot of time speaking to people who are already believers. Speaking to people who are already believers. Because it's necessary for us to continue to learn and to grow. So the gospel, when it's spoken, should one, it should transform. It should change families. It should force you to look at the world in a radically different way. The gospel should, number two, number one is transform. You see that word transform. Number two, the gospel should also offend because it should also force us to look in the mirror and realize that we have fallen short and all of humanity is broken and we want to be reunited and mended, transformed by God through Jesus Christ. And then the third one, it should be hopeful. It should bring hope uh, that there is not just a better day ahead, uh, but that when we connect with God, when we are transformed, when we face ourselves, and we transform our situation, something beautiful happens every time. And that brings hope. And then the fourth thing is it should be prophetic, meaning it should force us to look at what God demands us to do, especially with those who are vulnerable. So it should transform, it should offend, it should bring hope, it should be prophetic. Now, I bring those four uh, pieces that I just lifted up. It's really lifted up from a great homiletician named Jared Alicantara, who is at Baylor University and does a beautiful job sharing what the gospel is in his own uh, unique way. So Stephen is speaking to those who are already uh, believers but now he's saying, we, we've got to do this differently. We've got to be better than we are. Every single day we have to work. Then the final piece. The people are offended by Stephen. They're offended by him. And they then decide to stone him. But do not miss this. This is the crux of everything that I want you to hear tonight. Stephen prays for people who cause him pain. Mm. In other words, I, I don't want affliction upon you. I want conviction. I want you to be better than you are right now. And often for those who cause us pain, we have all kinds of scenarios that flow into our mind where we want something to happen to that individual and then they'll be convicted because something terrible happened in their life. Stephen is saying, I'm not looking for the affliction, but I do want them to be convicted. Lord, uh, do not, do not hold this against them. Just as Jesus said, Stephen is mimicking Jesus who said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, that they are killing your son. And right there, as all this is happening, is Saul, who will become Paul. Because he was standing in this moment and witnessed someone who knew the tradition who was presenting a gospel that was transformative and also offensive, who was pushing the people to be better, 
And as a result, those people who claim to represent God end up leaning into not their better angels, but into the demons of their spirit, and they stone this man to death. But Saul was there and witnessed it. And I believe that as a result of witnessing that, it rested in the back of his mind that Saul continued to go and uh, also persecute people who were followers of the way Christians. But when he was convicted, I believe that that image of what he used to do to people rested in his spirit. And he was transformed in such a way that it would transform literally uh, the geography, the landscape, the spiritual landscape of the world. You have to have a spirit where you're willing to pray for those who cause you pain. Because if you believe that everyone has the stamp of the divine upon them, the stamp of God, God's fingerprint, then there is no one is completely evil and no one is completely good that all of us have horns and halos. And if we can tap into, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, our better angels, then amazing, beautiful, powerful, and transformative things can happen in our world. And Stephen was giving us an example of how we are to engage in this world. I love Stephen. He's a great brother. He does some wonderful work. So I hope this lesson today blesses you about a courageous brother who was committed to the gospel. The seventh chapter in Acts. Now next week we're going to be examining Africans who shaped our faith. We'll be looking at the eighth chapter of Acts. And I'm going to really go into depth about why uh, Christianity is an African tradition. It is not European. It is not. We have to release that notion and reclaim what our ancestors developed. Thank you so much for being with us for Wednesday at the Well on this day that the Lord has made. I look forward to being with you next week and I have a special announcement. This Sunday I will be announcing uh, the date of when we will be returning to church. I hope you'll join us on Sunday. I'm looking forward to the word. I will be examining Africans who shaped our faith this coming Sunday. And we have some great things that we want to share with you uh, during this family month, during this pride month. And we are just grateful that you are with us on this day. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this moment. Gracious and loving God, may we have the courage and the commitment to be able to speak with authority, to know our tradition, and to speak those, speak with those, speak to those who already are supposedly know the tradition and know you. And teach us how to pray for those who cause us pain, that they may not be afflicted, but they may be convicted by you. We offer this prayer in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Thank you for being with us for Wednesday at the Well, uh, the truth about the church series as we explore the book of Acts. I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and running over. Shall the Lord give into your lap. We, the village of Trinity, are committed to lifting up Christ, engaging our community and celebrating our culture. Today, your gifts of tithes and offering will allow the work of Trinity to continue as we seek to provide ministry and resources to those who are incarcerated, ill, hungry, hurting, and whose backs are against the walls. There are multiple ways for you to support the ministry of Trinity with your tithes and offerings. You may give through our Secure Give application. You may also text to give by dialing 855-781-8384. You can also use our cash app, dollar sign, Trinity UCC, or use our website. With a few easy clicks, you will be well on your way to support this ministry. Also, our First Fruits Direct Draft program allows you to make your church a priority. 
And if you prefer to mail your gift, simply send your tithe or donation to 400 West, 95th Street. Thank you for supporting Trinity United Church of Christ, the greatest church this side of the Jordan.